Hi everyone, AMD the Queen of Sexy here. I have recorded this opening about four or five times already. Um, I am nervous about this next episode and that is why I keep recording this opening over and over again. So I'm just going to kind of wing it and speak from the heart. Uh, this episode is about me, <laughs> which usually the episodes are not about me. Um, but this one is, you know, I wanted to share with you what's been going on in my life, a little bit about some behind the scenes stuff and share with you like my current journey of healing from the trauma of losing my leg in May of 2020. I'd also like to acknowledge my white privilege and acknowledge the fact that I am able to go home to a loving family and be taken care of. And I understand that that is not a reality for so many other people. And so I just really want to acknowledge my privilege and that I am able to do that um, and that I find ways to share the fruits of my labor with my other community members um, and to share the privilege that I receive from others. I like to share it uh, with my community members and I um, I do a lot of that. So um, because I acknowledge, you know, fuck, I have privilege and I've had for a long time. So I just want to be really open and honest about that. And I'd also like to acknowledge the stolen land that I'm broadcasting from and that I live on. Um, I live on a piece of land that is in the middle of what once was occupied by three different native tribes. And those tribes are the Susquehannock, the Massawomick, and the Pisca Ta'awe. So um, I, I pay homage and, and honor those the land that we're on that was just straight up stolen from people who did not deserve that type of treatment. Um, and I am working every day to find new principles to live by, uh, to unlearn my own white supremacy and raise this ways of being and to relearn um, so that I can show up better and do better for all communities um, that need it the most, the most marginalized communities. Um, so I say all of that to say that the rest of this episode will be about me and my things that I've been going through. And um, I mostly wanted to share because I know there's so many other people going through such a hard time. And I wanted to do this as a way to normalize talking about what we're feeling and what we're going through. I'd also like to give a trigger warning and let you know that there will be a segment where suicidal thoughts are a topic of discussion. Um, if you or anyone you know is considering suicide or talking about suicide um, and you'd like help, um, you can visit suicidepreventionlifeline.org or you can call their hotline number, which is open 24-7 to receive calls, which is 1-800-273-TALK. Again, that's 1-800-273-8255. I am ready for you to hear all the things. And uh, another warning, I might cry a little bit on this episode. So thank you so much for being a wonderful audience. And um you know, feel free to let me know what you think about this episode. Okay, here we go. I'm, I'm here with uh, my producer Mackenzie. So hi. Hi. Um, I'm just I'm actually really happy that you're here with me because um, you know, you're such a huge part of this show, and a lot of people mm -hmm. don't know that that you are you know behind the scenes all the time, and that we're you know we do all of this work together, and the show wouldn't be possible without you, etc. So. Thank you for this opportunity. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. It feels like such an honor to be part of this. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just, you know, to let everyone know why today's episode is a little different is, um, you know, I've been going through a lot of stuff and I've just like, I've not been sharing and um, I, not that I have like this obligation to share my life with everyone, but I just, I feel like with what's been going on that. Um, I just want to be transparent and I, I want to be honest with everyone about what's been going on in my life and like, you know, some of the things that I've been dealing with and hopefully, you know, not just to like get things off of my chest as sort of like a confession almost, but like also 
if other people are feeling similarly and going through something like I just hate pretending or looking like I've got all of this shit all together and because I personally like I can't stand looking at like influencers and stuff and being like oh my god their life is so perfect and mine is terrible you know I don't want to be that person just sharing all of my triumphs I want to share my failures and and the, the low points so that's kind of the purpose of doing this and like a lot has happened in the last 12 months so that's why we're here today and am some people i think follow you on social media and they see see every little thing that's happening and some people just tune in for the podcast Mm -hmm. uh do you want to just talk about some of the major changes that have been going on for you lately yeah yeah i think so thank you um so, you know, I'm, I moved. I'm living in Pennsylvania now, again, with my mom um, because, you know, for reasons that I can't get into quite yet, um, I had to leave my home in L.A. Um, you know, we moved in to this house that we called Babetown House. It was supposed to be like an art commune. We moved in on March 1st of 2020. And so, like, <laughs> if you do the math – Right. We found out about COVID like a week later. And I remember very specifically like sitting on the couch in the front part of the house where I was like obsessed with sitting. And, you know, my housemate came home and she came home early from a gig. She had only been gone for like two hours. She was supposed to be on set all day. And she came home with her eyes like wide open and just looked at me and like was shaking her head. I'm like, what are you doing at home? And she's like, they sent us all home. They you know, they came into the room, they burst into the room, all of a sudden, we're like, everyone has to leave because of COVID. And so we just like had just moved into like this dream situation. And like the rug was pulled out from underneath of us, just like everyone else. Um, And it just completely changed the trajectory of the entire year. Like we had spent all of this money, all of this time moving from all of these different apartments into this house. And then all of a sudden, it was like the end of the world. And um, and it was not easy living there from then on. And it, 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 there's a lot of trauma, traumatic things that happen living in that house that I'm still legally not allowed to talk about. <laughs> so just to give you an idea of like, yeah, shit got fucking weird and it got really hard. And I never have, I have not been able to talk about it the entire time publicly. And I'm still not able to really get into the details or even like even vagueness of what happened in that home. But on top of that, two months into COVID, my half of my, you know, I wasn't, you know, that I had a half foot before I became an amputee, right? Like, yeah, 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 I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so that accident that I had in December of 2018 led me to have half of a left foot. And then that in May started to like break down and the bones, the bones were trying to be like, hi, can we see you outside of your flesh? And I was like, no, you can't. That would really suck. (laughs) Please stop trying to come out. And so, you know, I had always kind of known since becoming a half foot amputee that I would potentially have to become a below the knee amputee. Like that was always something that like plagued me since the first day of since that accident and um so lo and behold it's like mid-may and um my doctor is like oh it's time for another surgery and i'm like is this my life now just like every year and a half i have to get a new surgery on this half foot you know and so i was tasked with having to decide for myself to get an elective below the knee amputation so like I had to decide I and and I spent two weeks asking myself like am I crazy for potentially saying hey doc I want to cut off some bones today and so I would I would periodically like check in with professionals and doctors and be like uh, am I like totally overreacting and being crazy? And they're like, no, (laughs) you are not crazy. This is a decision you have to make. And so I ultimately chose to do the below the knee amputation. So the day I went 
into the hospital was May 28th. Again, let's do some math. On May 25th, George Floyd was killed. So I'm in the hospital, just had my foot cut off on all kinds of drugs, looking up at the TV and like the world is on fire. And I'm sitting there like just completely helpless, like physically, emotionally, like just fucked, you know? And I immediately went into the mode of like, how do I save the world? And not even acknowledging that like, I have a huge handicap now. And I didn't even consider what the journey of that would be like, because I was so focused on, you know, the, the white supremacist issue in our world and in our country that I never stopped to analyze myself and, you know, what was going on. And, and then a couple months after that, <laughs> um, my union job that I had lined up just went away because of COVID. And it was the first time in my life that I had a job where it was like, hey, we're going to give you salary and benefits, you know, and that was a week before COVID that got approved. And then shortly after COVID, they were like, no, 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 let's, let's slow down. Like, we're going to do this with you, but we just have to wait. And then it turned into, you know what, this isn't happening. And it was just like loss after loss, after loss, again, like everyone else. But what I tend to do, and I did do, is I just compartmentalize every loss and put it in like a storage unit in the back of my head and just kept going. And I never took a moment to like give myself the space to take care of myself. So, cut to now, <laughs> and it's like, oh, you can't, you can't hide those things in the back of your head. Those things are here now. And the buildup of all of those things, you know, put me, like, things got really kind of freaky, scary when I would be alone, um... And drinking, which I probably shouldn't have been doing, but like, whatever, I love wine. Um, <laughs> and, you know, just having like weird thoughts that I, it's really hard to say out loud. I think, I know I myself and I think a lot of people have struggled with thoughts like that at different times and especially during COVID. Um, you know, if you don't feel comfortable getting into things explicitly, uh, of course, like you've already shared so much and been so vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, but do you want to talk at all about what was going on internally? Um, yeah. I think a lot of people look up to you and it doesn't mean that's your responsibility to be yeah. vulnerable for everybody. But I also know that I personally, just being friends with you and talking to you have like gained a lot um, over quarantine from just hearing you say that that you feel these things. It's so much yeah. less isolating. Yeah. So yeah, I don't mind talking about it. Um, yeah, I, the, mo the thoughts that I'm having is that, um, life is probably, or death is probably better than life. And I don't have thoughts of like, well, that's not true. I, I was about to say, I don't have thoughts of how I would kill myself, <laughs> but you know, I don't go too deep into those thoughts because it just sounds like so much work you know, it's like, if I did, if I did commit suicide, which is, you know, something that, you know, those thoughts have crossed my mind. And it, it takes a lot for me to say that out loud, because, um, you know, for so long, not that I judged suicidal thoughts, but I just thought, I just love life so much. I just love life. I could never. Um, and then, you know, <laughs> 2020 came along. <laughs> um, and it's not the first time I've had those thoughts. I remember having suicidal thoughts when I, um, 
uh, during part of my breakup with my ex. Um, but it was a much shorter time than I had those thoughts because lately it's like, it's like weeks and weeks of like, oh, that telephone pole would be really easy to run into. Um, and because I've done like pretty hardcore mushroom trips and I could be totally naive in saying this, but I like feel like I know what it's like to be in a different dimension and like dead basically. <laughs> and I'm like, that is fun. Like <laughs> 2020 is not fun. Earth is not fun. <laughs> Being in another dimension is totally fun. And um, like maybe that would be better. And that's kind of where, where I go when I imagine, oh, death would be better than life. And then I watched this series called Surviving Death on Netflix, which really quick review. Some of it is great and some of it is like kind of, eh. um, but there's the stories that the people who tell of like surviving death and having um, a near death experience is that it's just so loving and warm and there's an embrace and uh, it's, it's like a hug that's not a physical hug. It's like your whole being is being hugged. And I think that that sounded so appealing to me because like I spent like the last 12 months just like wanting to be hugged, but like only by someone that I want to hug me. You know, I don't want to hug just anybody. You know, I didn't want to hug from just anybody. I wanted, I wanted it to be from who I chose it to be from. And it just didn't feel like that was an option. And I didn't even, I didn't reach out to anybody and I didn't, like, I would have these fantasies of like asking, um, some of my guy friends, very specific ones, like, Hey, can you come over and just like cuddle with me? And I never did it because I felt stupid. It's really hard to reach out. And once you're on the other side of it, it's easy to see that you could have reached out, but when you're in those moments, it just feels impossible. You're just plagued with all these thoughts that come yeah. from those dark places. Yeah. But, you know, when people are in those places, like they're, they're never a burden. They're never asking too much. Yeah. They're never, you know, uh, like everybody always has value and, and you yeah. deserve to ask those things of people when you're in that place. Yeah. And so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And so I think, yeah, because I was learning about in, in the near-death experiences that you're just, like, basically getting hugged. I'm like, oh, that sounds so nice. I just, I want to do that, you know? And, um, but again, if I was going to do something um, to put myself in a death situation, I mean, it would, I was talking about this to one of my closest friends. Like, it would have to be so certain. Like, I'm not going to try it and fuck up like that is a problem, <laughs> like it has to work, you know? And so, um, yeah, I just, I would like to say that I'm not, I, I just want to say for the record, I'm not suicidal and I'm not worried and I'm not asking anybody to be worried about that necessarily. Um, but it, it is a thought. And I think that it's an all too common thought that a lot of people have that like, we just don't say out loud, you know? And instead I just decided like, and I'll just keep it quiet because, like, I'm embarrassed to say that because so many people say to me, like, oh, you've got it all together. Like, you know what you're doing. It's like, no, like, I'm fucking up all the time. I'm losing friends. I'm pissing people off. I'm not making money. I, you know, I'm still, my legs aren't as strong as they could be. Like, I'm constantly fucking up. And there's almost, like, pressure in that when people say that you know, and not that I'm offended when people say it, but, um, because I get what it looks like and I get that, sure, I'm doing a lot of cool things, but I don't have it all together. In fact, I need help just like anybody else does, you know? So I just don't want like this false idea of me that I think that I'm all great and powerful, even though I people call me the queen. It started out as a fun name a long time ago, and it's turned into like this persona, you know, which I'm happy to take it on. But I just, just want people to understand and see like, 
I'm still like fucking just as human as everybody else, you know? Yeah, that, that's so important. Cause I, I think as somebody who's a public figure, like you said, a lot of times it's easy for influences or public personalities to just show the good parts. Right. And even when they show the bad, it's a carefully curated picture of exactly. what the bad looks like. And I think that what you're saying is really important, like being the queen, this, this idea of perfection, it doesn't exist. And like, when you talk about fuck ups, I think mistakes are really important and learning is really important. Mm. But also I think that like not being perfect isn't the same thing as a fuck up. And I think you're very driven and very hardworking. And it's easy to look at anything that's a perceived perfection and go, oh my God, I did that wrong. But, right. you know, from the outside, you're somebody who's always learning and nothing gets wasted. Anything that might not be perfect, you turn around and make it a way to grow. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm actually working on that right now because there's like ongoing, you know, issues in my community and, and not the not just the community as a whole, which there's always there's always things that we have to deal with in the sex worker community, but with like my very tight knit community that I've been friends with for years, like there is a lot of tension there and um, I'm very sad about it. And I see, um, I see all kinds of perspectives. I see their perspective. I see my perspective and um, you know, it's, it's been really painful losing those friends. And I, and so the reason why I wanted to have this conversation is because I'm looking at where everything is now and I'm like everything is where it is now because of like it's a culmination of all of these things that happened over time and me not processing my trauma and whatever is not an excuse for things that have happened or mistakes that I've made but it's just I think that this particular year these last 12 months has been so hard for so many people that if it had not been so hard like, would we have responded differently to things? Would we have slowed down in, um, you know, how we processed certain things that have been happening? And um, I, I just, I, I'm very not, I'm not very happy with how things are. And I, and there's not much I can do to fix it or change it at this point. And, um, and I just, I want any of my friends that are listening that are not talking to me right now that um, I think about you every single day with love. Every single day when I wake up, sometimes all day. So my community is really, really important to me. And I feel like in mine, not processing my own shit, that I've not been able to show up the way I would have liked to. Um, again, I'm not making excuses. Just acknowledging. <laughs> yeah, so. that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, coming back to what you said about, you know, not processing trauma, um, you know, creating a, a barriers or conflict in your life. Um, I know you said earlier that that's something that's just always on the back burner for you. Do you want to take some time and just even outside of the actual concrete experiences, like just talk about what you've been feeling through all of these changes and all this loss? Yeah. I, yeah, I've been feeling like I'm failing. I I used to, when I was younger, have like this real fear of what would happen to me when I was older. And then I like did a lot of work on that and I became a lot more confident in where I was going and trusting in the universe. And, you know, very recently I'm like, this <laughs> thought came into my head, like, I have no kids. I have no nieces or nephews. <laughs> um, I have no partner. I have no property. <laughs> uh what the fuck do i have for when i'm like 80 years old like i'm imagining myself at 80 and um you know and it was the first time in a long time where i felt like 
am I going to be okay when I'm this older person? And I think I feel that way because I imagine sometimes like when I'm taking a shower or like more importantly, getting in and out of the shower. Um, once I'm in the shower, I'm pretty square, but getting in and out of the shower is like, what's this going to be like when I'm 80? Cause I plan to live to 120, you know, goals. So like, <laughs> what's this going to be like when I'm 80 at one point, at what point is things going to just, you know, because we, we, um, gosh, that's not the right word. I almost said deteriorate <laughs> when we get older. We like, we weaken, you know, and, and that naturally will happen. Not to say that I can't make, be strong and, you know, but I'm thinking about those types of things. I, I'm thinking about what it will be like then. And I also am trying to figure out where my leg went. Like I look down and I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Because, and I only just started doing that like a month ago. And it's, and I had my amputation um, on May 29th of 2020. And only a month ago, I'm like, what? My leg is missing. What the fuck? Because I never, I was like, okay, get to work, get to work right away. You know, there was no, nothing was going to stop me. That, and that was all ego driven, you know? And so now I'm just like, where the fuck is my leg? What the fuck? Is this some fucking sick joke? Because you never expect ever. And I'm sure any disabled person who was born perfect, you know, able-bodied will could say the same thing. I never in a million years would have expected this to happen, especially when it's like, boom, like that, you know? And um, I, I would say for the longest time, like, oh, it's just carbon. It's just carbon. It's just a thing that happened. And while, yes, that's true, I never allowed the sentient part of me to feel the loss because, like, it's the death of a leg, you know? And I have to – I've been having to remind myself, like, I'm a sentient being as much as I would rather not be when I'm feeling pain because I love being a sentient being when I'm like on ecstasy or something like that <laughs> or when I'm having sex, you know, unless I'm like, yes, or like when you're having a great time with your family. I love being a sentient being in those, but, but I hate being a sentient being when um, like pain is involved, which I'm learning to love. Um, but I've had to remind myself like there's a duality of in life and being a sentient being is you know it's just a part of this process and so I just I try not to process things that hurt me and then they always catch up with me and that's what's happening right now and that's why I'm like not on social media because I don't even know what to say yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing all of that. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Thank yeah. you for listening. Yeah. I find that when I am talking on social media, I, I'm just like yelling at a lot of people and that's not very helpful to anybody, you know? And as I was doing it, I was like, bitch, why you're just yelling at everyone. What are you doing? And I'd be like, no, 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 this is good. This is a good thing. Everyone needs to get yelled at. And then like later I'm like, what? Why were you just yelling at everybody? But of course I'm leaving it up there because I want everyone to see my mistakes and my faults and I don't want to hide. I don't want to take something down because I'm like, oh, that's so I'm embarrassing myself. No, I want you to see me embarrassing myself because that is real fucking life. Yeah, it's so important to show that. Again, it, it creates such an unrealistic standard if everybody just shows the best of themselves all the time. Right. And I'm sure there was an element too of, you know, going through all this change. So many things were happening that were out of your control. And I think yeah. it's really natural to sometimes feel the need to try and control the outside circumstances because outside circumstances have done so much to affect your life. Um, 
it's hard in that moment to kind of go, okay, I can just be an example and, and control uh, myself. Hello, cat. <laughs> yeah. She's been sitting here this whole time. So I just wanted to say hello. Well, I'm glad um, she did. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's been a lot. Um, and there, there's even like, like I said, there's even more traumatic things that were happening that I can't talk about yet mm -hmm. um, that were like traumatic to like, I felt like I was in danger mm -hmm. more than once, quite often, actually, I felt yeah. like I was in danger. Yeah. So <clears throat> it's been a really hard year. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It really and, just hasn't stopped. Right. From my perspective, it's been one thing after another, after another. And like you said, everybody's going through something hard right exactly. now, but that never means that you shouldn't express and explore your own pain and validate the right. trauma that you're going through. Right. And that's exactly what I did. Cause I'm like, all the strippers need money. I'm mm -hmm. going to raise money for strippers where, you know, at, at strippers United formerly known as soldiers of pole, we like, busted our ass to figure out how to help strippers get their money and there was just and then on top of that like white supremacy oh my god mm -hmm. how do we get that dismantled right and so yeah. that that was that's that was and has been and still is like of a, a huge focus but at and like what happened was i got so so far beyond my trauma without processing it and so burnt out that now I'm doing the bare minimum at this moment. And that's mm -hmm. the last place I want to be. Yeah. And if I had just given myself some time or done more self care, then I, you know, whatever I'm doing that now, right? I don't need to do that to myself. I'm doing it now. I'm doing the yeah. self care now so that I can get back to that place. But, um, you know, I'm still reading and doing the things I'm just not activated. And, um, and that, that's another reason why I say I feel like I'm failing. Um, and yeah, it's really hard to say out loud, because I'm an overachiever. <laughs> and an A type personality and failure is not an option, right? <laughs> And I think that black and white thinking is so easy to fall into yeah. because we put ourselves in this pass fail category for every aspect of our lives. <laughs> and okay. that's not what it comes down to. I, I mean, right. there's so much peace in accepting the middle ground and yeah. even coming back to addressing your trauma and addressing other people's trauma. Like, I think we forget that it's possible to do both. You can say my right. life is hard and I'm giving myself time for that and it's hard for other people and I'm supporting them. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think when you prioritize things like social issues and, you know, taking care of other human beings, which I know is a priority for you, sometimes it can feel like caring for yourself is selfish. You're saying, well, I only have so much energy and I need to give all of it to this other cause. And we forget in the moment that burnout is very, very real. Yeah. And the trauma is very real and it will come back to you. Yeah. And it's really difficult to allocate your time, not entirely to the things you're passionate about, but it's like that, you know, saying about the, the mask on an airplane, like you do have to take care of yourself because if you right. don't, you'll eventually get to a place where you can't take care of yourself or anybody else. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it, uh, th thankfully I haven't, you know, I, I realize, okay, shit is really bad. Like I have to go home now. Like I have to get out of here. I have to go home mm -hmm. and I have to go somewhere where I'm safe so that I can focus and get healthy again, you know? Yeah. Um, and so that's why I left LA, which is like heart wrenching for me. I love LA slash I'm so pissed off at LA right now. You know, it's just um, like who is running that shit show? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. they have a lot of work to do so um it was really really hard to leave LA it's been my home since 1999 um so you know now I'm having to grieve LA and I'm sure I'll go back but it's 
never going to be the LA that I knew it was, Mm -hmm. you know, that it was for uh, all of us. So that's, I'm sad. I miss all of my friends, my neighbors, specifically my neighbors, my housemates. Yeah. That was a tough decision to make, but yeah, I'm I'm very happy that I'm here. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. And I've heard you talk some here and there about your relationship uh, with your family and that Mm -hmm. your mom has been really supportive, um, and just a positive force in your life. Uh, I think a lot of people have done that. A lot of people have gone home during this. I know I've spent a couple months here and there. Do you want to talk some about that? Cause I think there's also shame around that about needing to just get away and be close to family. Yeah, I do. Because, you know, I, (sighs) For me, I think there was shame and like my mom was like, just come home, come home. I'm like, no, mom, I'm not doing that. I'm fine. I'm going to figure it out. I've got to figure it out. I don't need to come home at 40 years old. I'm fine. And then as time went on, I'm like, fuck this shit, man. I need someone to make me dinner. Uh, (laughs) I need someone to buy my groceries for a little while. Just because like I just couldn't, like going to the grocery store became Mm. such a thing. Mm -hmm. you know just uh, uh, not only because covid i have a foggy brain because i'm also walking around the grocery store with one hand Mm -hmm. on a cart and one hand on my cane yeah you know and and grocery stores are big um (laughs) so you know so there's those types of things and i i think it's really beautiful that a lot of people have gone home and and been with their parents because like what is the social construct that we've created where it's like you're a loser if you're living at home with your family. Yeah. That's that's a fucking construct just like everything else that we mm-hmm. do that we do that because we think we have to do it because that's what we've been told and that's how mm-hmm. it is. And so like once I like got over that, like the decision to move was really easy cuz like mm-hmm. I know this town, I know this area, I know this house. You know, I've been coming to this house since 1986 when my grandparents first built it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's our family gathering place. I think if you can go home, go home. Like, we need to be with each other right now anyways, because we've been, we're all so isolated and there's so much pain of what happened Mm -hmm. in 2020. And uh, of course, all of the years leading up to 2020, I mean, 2020 was just a huge eye opener, wasn't it? All this shit already existed. 2020 was just like (laughs) glasses on. Oh, I can see all the bullshit now, you know? So I think that, um, you know, I could live here for a while. Yeah. Why not? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think there's any shame in going home. I think that any shame around going home is based on the social construct that you should be ashamed of living with your parents. And I just think that that's bullshit. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree very much. I mean, yeah. I, I'm new to learning about this, but what I have been learning lately is that the shame against multi-generational living is like, it's very a white Western stigma and it's not healthy for anybody to be holding up this idea that a something that's very supportive and positive is something we should be ashamed of. And B it's just another expression of white supremacy. It's saying, Oh, well, other people live this way, but, somehow we're different and better and so we shouldn't live that way it's so toxic and so damaging it's so toxic so damaging and uh, i'm sorry to burst your white people's bubbles white people (laughs) but y'all are not better in fact (laughs) on the totem pole (laughs) your score is low okay (laughs) you've been fucking up (laughs) so yeah i you're right i think that being white and living in a white supremacist world where we're like under this sort of construct and regime that they've created from whenever the fuck they started creating it. It's like, it's very damaging to not only all of the other races, but like to ourselves as well. Like, why are we treating ourselves this way? Why are we treating each other this way? Oh, it's shameful for you to live with your parents. It's shameful for you to sleep with a lot of people. It's shameful for you to um, decide that you don't want to carry that baby. Like, Mm-hmm. who the fuck why where where did you get all of these ideas from and you know and so and i say all of that too it's like part of the other thing that i'm struggling with is 
every single thing that I hear and see, I'm like, patriarchy, white supremacy, capitalism, Mm -hmm. smash it all. Like I can't see anything. I can't see anything without like shitting on it and sounding like Wednesday from the Adams family (laughs) where like everything is dark and terrible and everybody sucks, you know? (laughs) Give you an example. I was watching Saturday Night Live with my mom the other night and this young singer came on bridge something bridge bridger bridgers. bridgers yeah 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 there you go mm-hmm. a little white girl a little very very white girl right she starts yeah. singing i'm like whatever she's kind of cute and then one of the lines in her song was i'm going to kill you unless you get to it first and i was like fuck that fuck that shit like and i just popped off in front of my mom and was like white supremacy that's disgust. like, that's not cool. Like, that's dangerous. Like, mm-hmm. to, to say, like, oh, you should kill yourself, basically, is what she's saying. And my mom, like, couldn't get it at first. Because mm-hmm. my mom's like, she's so cute. And, da, da, da. <laughs> and so, like, the next day, I'm like, mom, the reason why you thought it was cute is because she was a little white girl singing mm-hmm. that. Yeah. A black person mm-hmm. was on stage saying, I want to kill you unless you get to it first all yeah. fucking hell would break loose. So mm-hmm. I'm looking at this little blonde girl and like just totally shitting on her and she's very cute and talented and the band is good and stuff, you know? And I'm just like, leave it to AM to find something completely <laughs> fucked up about it. And like, that's the state that I'm in right now mm-hmm. quite often. Everything I see, everything I hear, capitalism, white supremacy, patriarchy, fuck mm-hmm. it all. And so yeah. I'm just like, Maybe I just shouldn't be talking to people right now. No, but I think that's what it is <laughs> once you're aware. You know, I, yeah. I remember going through different phases of my life where, like you said, the glasses were put on and someone educated me. Yeah. And once your eyes are open to it, white supremacy, patriarchy, and capitalism are the default everywhere you look all the time. And we're operating within that. And I think part of disrupting the system is being that and we're going to get told that we're angry or we're Mm -hmm. annoying or Mm -hmm. we bring everything back to something quote unquote political right that's how you dismantle something is you don't let little things slip by because it's not just the big things Mm -hmm. it is yeah that's a good point yeah but like also it's such a mess that that also is what leads to like some of my depression that I'm dealing with. Like mm-hmm. why, why try? It's so powerful and deep. And then mm-hmm. I see these kids on TikTok um, and I'm just like so impressed by the younger generation and like mm-hmm. what they're capable of doing and they give me hope and sex workers give me hope. So that helps. Yeah. Yeah. But and sometimes I, I, it feels hopeless. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say that I, I think that's that's part of it too, though. It's like small moments of outrage and not letting things slip by without addressing them. Like, right. that's how we support these people. We can look to TikTok. We can look to people doing good work on social media and in the media at large And we can say, I support you. And what does that mean? It means taking what they teach you and bringing it to all these small moments. So I think that, you know, that is still an act of rebellion against the systems in place. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like all I've been doing is rebelling and, um, and it's, it's exhausting, but it's like so necessary you know um yeah so i'm glad that i'm not the only one i have been connecting with some of my friends who are basically saying the same thing they can't have like a conversation with someone without being like well that's the patriarchy (laughs) (laughs) but it is it always is so all of this like all of this i'm dealing with culminates to me like not being able to do any kind of work that like is surrounding just myself for mm-hmm. instance, teaching online, I just, it's a lot. 
and yeah. promoting myself in that fashion and then doing any kind of sex work, any kind at all, even taking photos of me being sexy is emotional labor that is just like not in my bones right now. I just mm-hmm. can't even, and I'm, I'm getting hit up a lot in my DMs, like, hey, will you make videos? Because I was making custom videos for a little while. Like, hey, will you make videos? Will you do this? Will you chat? And I'm just, I'm just like, no, mm-hmm. I can't. I can't. And they're like, well, when are you going to be able to? I don't know. Yeah. I just don't know. And it's not that I don't love sex work because I do, because I've done it for like 20 years. It's just mm-hmm. like, I just can't right now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it comes back to that rallying cry of you don't know anybody shit. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, so I'm glad that we're here in this part of the conversation now, because that brings me to the point of something that you and I have been talking about for a while now about Mm -hmm. this podcast in particular. And Mm -hmm. like, I'm already like excited, like getting ready to talk about this, but you know, the idea of turning this podcast into more of a community podcast and, and one obviously that I would still be very, very heavily involved in and still would host. But, you know, we talked about having some new hosts that are permanent hosts because it's really important to me that there's someone leading the conversation that doesn't look like me. Yeah. I.e., um, I'm I'm looking, you know, we're looking for hosts for uh, for the community that are uh, people of color hosts, so that we can have like a diverse lineup of hosts. I'm looking for like two other people. So, yeah. If you, you know, that's a lot of this, you know, we've been waiting a long time to talk about this and, and release mm-hmm. it. And, um, you know, it's, it's been part of the work that I've been trying to do in, okay, how do I actually do the work and how do I thoughtfully give or share the platforms, um, with other people? And, um, this is this isn't something I've wanted to do for a while, so this is a call. This is a call out to, to whoever's listening, who, um, is interested in being a host and hosting, you know, other strippers and sex workers in the community. So I'm really excited at the idea of doing something like this. Yeah. And I'm so grateful that (laughs) you had this idea and that you were open to sharing this platform because I think you're right. I think we're learning all the time, but right now this seems to be you know, one of the most effective ways that, you know, women like you, who you've worked really hard to build this audience, and what can you do to be productive with that? You can shout out issues that are important to you, and I think even more than that is not not being the person shouting it out, and stepping aside, and letting someone else take the mic for a minute. Yeah, because it's, you know, it's dawned on me that there are some questions that i that I don't even know to ask, or there are some questions that are really inappropriate for me to ask Mm -hmm. because of who I am, what I look like, you know, and like, and, um, you know, I made this one video on Instagram where I was like, give black people everything that you have. And, you know, I look back on that. I was like, one, one, black woman commented she's like okay sis eat some barbecue because you could tell I was just so stressed out that maybe I was hungry or something I don't know (laughs) but you know while I was saying that I I had had this intention in mind it's just um you know having to move and having to deal with all of those things you know I wanted to wait until the timing was right so it could be done thoughtfully Mm -hmm. um and so now I feel like this is the right time and I really want to share and I also am like interested and open to the ideas of like doing panel discussions where it's like a very mm-hmm. diverse panel of hosts slash guests talking about um important topics so that's another thing that I would like to see happen so yeah hit us up yeah, I, okay. I love the panel idea and yeah. where would be the best ways for people to reach out to you? Yeah, I think like Instagram at Yes a Stripper Podcast and um, email is great. Yes a Stripper Podcast at gmail dot com. Um, or if some of you are friends with me and know me personally, just in my DM, like you know how to get a hold of me. So yeah, just like and um, I do intend on um, 
making a website. Uh, yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm going to start in the next few days. So um, uh, there'll be more information on there. Hopefully, maybe I can get it done in a day. So maybe it'll be done by the time this podcast is out. <laughs> And if it is, I'll put a blurb at the end that confirms that. <laughs> so we'll see. It's it's ambitious, but I think I can do it. So I believe in you. I've seen your work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure that um, you know, I yeah, I, I, I think I feel like that's a lot. I feel like we covered a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to talk about? Uh, you know, we're talking about like changes you want to make in the podcast and ideas you have. Um, are there other aspects of what you're seeing for yourself going forward that you want to share? As far as like my life, like my personal life? Yeah, well, and just um, like, you know, the the endeavors that you were looking yeah. into before all of yeah. this happened. And, yeah. um, you know, the thoughts on how uh, I hope this isn't uh, too sensitive territory to go into but you know what you're thinking of as far as like how the landscape might be changed for you making money going forward yeah um, just anything that's on your mind for the future yeah okay um well I definitely still want to open a club um you yeah. know we were uh my partner and I were looking my my business partner and I Natalie Clark were looking for spaces before COVID hit like we were literally like looking at buildings like doing walkthroughs wow. yeah um you know we had investors interested we had a business plan i had vendors lined up you know it was like it was a, a dream that i've had for uh, several years that felt really palpable you know and then yeah. covid and it's like okay we yeah. can't open a bar business right now right <laughs> not a good idea and so um but we still you know we're still holding on to that dream and that vision and um i i just got inspired yesterday because for a while i was like when are we ever going to be able to do this is this even what i still want to do and then um i heard a veteran stripper say yesterday i want to start my own club and it was in a, it's, she's in arkansas and i was just mm -hmm. like you know what yeah let's yeah. let's all veteran strippers start our own club and yeah let's all do it and let's all be in network with each other and for each other and mm -hmm. um and so her comment yesterday like her just random what she would have thought was a random comment i was like okay yeah like yeah it, you know eventually we will be able to be around each other again in the capacity mm -hmm. that we once were um and uh, so that dream is not dead. I, I do plan on revisiting that dream. Um, yeah. And as for like making money right now, God, I have no idea. So I'm just like, not even that worried about it right now. I'm just like, yeah. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I still have dreams of opening a club, several, several and hoping other people do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I really hope that you do. And I think I am not alone in saying a lot of us want to support you in that dream. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I um, felt a lot of support around it. Go ahead. Can we squeeze in a stripper tip and four for one? Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. Want to be fabulous just like these strippers? Pay attention. It's stripper tips. I would, I would say that, you know, as sex workers and strippers that we... Um, have dealt with our fair share of trauma um where a lot of us you know we're on a different spectrum of of trauma that we've dealt with and it and it comes in all different types of forms and I would my tip is to not diminish that trauma because it will find you and catch up mm -hmm. to you and so um I subscribe to more holistic ways of dealing with um trauma issues, health, and um, that's like meditating and reading books by Deepak Chopra and Eckhart Tolle and, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, learning about ways to be more connected with the earth. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. that, and, uh, and I also deal with um, self-care by learning about science and the universe. 
um, because that helps me gain a better perspective. And so I would say, you know, deal with your trauma and find ways um, that are like healing to deal with the trauma. Um, don't turn to drugs and alcohol. <laughs> Or do, but you know, in moderation. <laughs> yeah, responsibly deal with your exactly. problems with drugs. <laughs> yeah, I was drinking a lot. And, uh... Just go do some mushrooms about it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So that would be my stripper tip. Get ready for our rapid fire question round. It's time for four for one. Most fun time you've had having sex outside? Oh, yes. Okay. So it was at my cousin's wedding and it was her cousin okay it was my cousin's cousin <laughs> we're not related by blood or marriage we're just connected by one person who is, happens to both be her cousin and we were pretty wasted and i had my period at the time and so we found like this barn that we were gonna go like hang out in and i was like mm, just give me a minute like i have to go to the bathroom and i hid behind a tree i took my shoe off took my sock off took my tampon out wiped myself with the sock left the sock and the tampon at the base of the tree i apologize environment for doing that <laughs> put my shoe back on without the sock went into the barn we tried to have sex and it was terrible because we were both oh. so wasted but <laughs> It was funny as shit. It was very funny. And it's a very funny story. I and the, oh also they were my brother's socks. And the next morning I said, Brother, I lost one of your socks, but I can't tell you how. And he was like, It's fine, I don't care. I don't need to know. I was like, Okay, good. <laughs> I think that's gotta be the most exciting sock loss story that's ever existed. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. What um, else? how about do you eat trash food have you ever dumpster dived or fished something out of the trash probably yes <laughs> probably yes because I like eat shit up off the floor like I just ate a cheese puff that fell on the floor the other day and had like all this cat hair on it so <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of any specific time but most likely yes I I've pulled like some sort of to-go box out of the trash or something I love it. I support it. I'm a yeah. trash food person. <laughs> um, how about, I know you're not supposed to have a favorite, but do you have a favorite of your cats? No, I don't. But I will tell you right here and right now, I have commissioned an artist to draw a conglomerate of my two cats into one so that I can have a <laughs> tattoo representing Aww. both cats without having two cats tattooed on me <laughs> that is beautiful yeah. I love that yeah. um you know what piggybacking off of that do you have a favorite tattoo of yours that'll be your fourth question no but I have a least favorite tattoo of mine oh, yeah? which is <laughs> um the Queen Elizabeth tattoo that I have on my right shoulder because mm. Mm -hmm. Of course, she's an imperialistic, colonial, you know, yeah. racist. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, I fucked up. So I'm getting it covered up. Hence why I'm getting the tattoo of the cats. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. What a wonderful solution. Yeah, I love exactly. It. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, thanks so much for sharing today, AM. Yeah. I really appreciate you being so open and thank taking you. time to talk through all this for everyone. Yeah, and thank you for doing this with me because, like, I didn't I there was nobody else that crossed my mind in doing this you know so um I appreciate you like always being open to my ideas and like you know well, it helps when they're all really good ideas yeah. <laughs> thank you yeah mm -hmm. thanks so much and um thanks everyone for listening feel free to hit me up and um share with me if anything has moved you or resonated with you I love hearing from everyone all the time. And um, I guess I'll close shamelessly one last time by saying we are taking donations for Yes a Stripper podcast um, so that we can start to pay our guests who the majority are out of work or have been out of work for an entire year. So that's at paypal.me forward slash Yes a Stripper podcast. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. 
just a reminder that if you or anyone you know is talking about suicide or needs help in the realm of suicide or suicidal thoughts or harm, you can visit suicidepreventionlifeline.org or call their phone number 1-800-273-8255. Hey, guess what? I ended up doing it. I made a new website. Yes, a stripperpodcast.com. Click on the apply button in the menu and go ahead and apply to be a new potential host for Yes, a Stripper Podcast. Thanks for listening, everyone. This episode has been a production with Period Podcast Network. Find out more on Instagram at Period Podcast Network. Be sure to follow us on Instagram too at Yes, a Stripper Podcast. And you can find us on Twitter at Yes, a Stripper Pod. Please like, subscribe, and rate Yes, a Stripper Podcast here on YouTube. See you next week.